check. Good morning. All right. <clears throat> All right, it's good to be with you this morning. Um, we've been doing a series, um, strength of strengths in the face of storms, and uh, Mike and Mark have done a nice job um, bringing the, bringing hope in the face of different kinds of storms. Today, they've asked me to talk a little bit about um, emotional storms. So. God's strength, how does God apply his strength to us in those times that we are overwhelmed or shocked or burdened by emotion? I've titled this, uh-oh, changed a bit. Luckily I got it here. <laughs> I've titled this, Emotions, the Cry of the Soul. And my goal with you this morning is to answer this question. If you have your worship folders, write this down because this is my question that I'm hoping I, I answer for you. And, and lead us to the place of communion is to think about this. How are our emotional reactions to the people and circumstances in, of our life deeply connected to our relationship with God? What I want to say to you today is that I'm not, here's what I'm, gonna, here's what I'm not going to tell you, is that all the emotions that you have, I'm not going to sort them into good and bad. I think they are all reactions that God has given us. And if we're made in the image of God, then those emotions, the emotions that we carry and the way in which we interpret and react to life, God has those emotions. Now, I'm calling them that they're, they're of divine origin. Most of you know and I know that sometimes if you came to my house and had the camera on, they wouldn't be godly displayed. True? True. So it's sometimes how many of you wouldn't want the camera in your house? How many of you wouldn't want the camera in your house this morning? You don't have to raise your hand this morning. Because the way we display it isn't always godly. But what I want to challenge you with is the belief that this, is, uh, this, this emotional stuff is something we're supposed to attend to. And it's something that we are, um, it's how we're like God. Now, I want to show you a picture, and just let your gut react to this picture. I heard it. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. oh, uh -huh. oh, everybody sees this. I was on the plane yesterday coming back from Detroit, and this was my first idea about this teaching. On my way back from Detroit, I, I watched this lady and her husband run, pushing a cart, to get to the flight that I was on. And I was sitting there because I was early, had been in the airport, been up since four, and been at the airport, you know, all morning. So I'm sitting there drinking a little uh, water and having something to eat. And I watched this couple run by, and they get there right in time for the boarding. And it turns out that because they had a stroller and a little baby, they ushered them to the front of the line and got them seated. And when I got on the plane, to my left was the lady and the little baby. I don't know where her husband went. But to the left was. And what I noticed about that is that that little baby was sitting in her mom's arms, and the mom was probably 25 or so. She was a young mom. And that baby's eyes was glued on mom. And mom's eyes was glued on that kid, just like this. And when that baby smiled, mom smiled. And when that baby made distress noises, mom tried to figure out what the deal is. Now, what I also noticed that was interesting was that everybody that came on the plane, including me, either tried to connect with the mom or, more importantly, dismissed the mom and started doing baby talk to the baby, right? <laughs> now, how many of you are guilty that see a little baby start talking crazy? Ooh, good, 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 good. Right? I contend that the first thing I want you to think about is that our emotional reactions come in the context of relationship. And just like this baby, we are all wired for connection. 
we're all wired to attach, is what I say here. We're all wired for attachment. Now, some of you will say, well, I don't need nobody. But see, that's a lie. Some of you say, people get on my nerves. That's, that, that may be true, but you still need them. But we're also wired to circumstances. God has gifted us to perform in a certain way, and we're wired. We're attached to that stuff. And it's in the attachments that we begin to develop a perspective, a worldview. Okay? Uh, God says this about, about his attachments. Let's see if I can find it this morning. In the Psalms, in the Psalms, if you want to if you want to take a look at what God says about emotions, you got to read the Psalms. But in Psalms 42, 1 and 2, it says this about attachments. David's writing, he says, As a deer pants for the streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I come and stand before him? See, I contend that not only are we connected and wired for attachment to people and circumstances. But deeper than that, some of you know and some of you are discovering you're wired for God. And you can fight against that or you can try to escape that. But it's there, undeniably. And later on in the Psalms, he writes this. Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you. In This parched and weary land where there is no water. See, when our resources come up short, then we start to think about God. And I contend that that's somehow maybe the way it's designed. So we're hardwired for attachments. The other thing that I wanted to say, second idea, is that that hardwiring creates a frame. I grew up in a family where there was alcoholism. And violence. So I have a frame for reality. I have, a, I have a expectations about how things should go. I have notions about things based on that frame. How many of you know that your expectations for life, for your relationships, and for the circumstances, how to handle circumstances you learned when you were a little kid. And that's why the scriptures call us to grow up. Paul says, move from milk to meat. Mature in your faith, which means he's calling us to move in our understanding of life and people and circumstances and God to a different place. But our basic response comes from the worldview that we have, the way we frame things. Family attachments frame our expectations. Frame our expectations. Now, here's the other thing. They also, we also create formulas. So, the adults in the room have a formula for how their marriage should go, what their relationship with their wife or husband should be like, how work should go, how it shouldn't go. The kids in here have formulas for what's a what, what a good relationship with my mom, a good relationship with my dad, what school should be like, what school shouldn't be like. They have a frame. And that frame helps us make a decision about what's good and what's bad. Okay? So the scriptures tell us that that's what we do. Our job is to look around, discern, check it out. And lots of times we get caught up in the people and the circumstances and lose God. Sometimes I have everything I need and I'm still thirsty. Why am I thirsty? Sometimes I have everything I want and I'm still hungry. Often it's because underneath the good that we have is still a thirst for a connection to God. And God is the ultimate good. The scriptures also say that we aren't very good at deciding what's good and what's bad. Often what we call good ain't good. And often what we call bad has good in it. Often what we move towards is not good for us. 
And often what we move away is the very thing that would challenge us. But the way this world is designed because we are believers in a fallen place and we have these expectations. And how many of you have people in your life that frustrate you? I ain't even looking. Because if you don't all raise your hand, you're lying to me. How many of you have had circumstances in your life that leaves you empty? You have. See, what happens is um, emotions, the storms happen when the people in my life or the circumstances in my life don't match the expectations. But here's what I'm going to ask you. They also, when my expectations aren't met, I not only question my wife, my daughter not only questions me, but if I ain't getting what I want, then I'm also questioning who? I can't hear you. Remember, where I'm from, y'all got to talk. <laughs> Let me say, the question who? God. God. Often our emotional reactions are connected to what we believe about God's care and, and protection and involvement in our lives. Now, when the challenges come, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Two things happen. When my life gets pressed or when life throws me a curve, I respond to it one of two ways. And I just want to see if I can get in. And the young people, you have to be in this too. When life gets tough, how many of you get tough back? Raise your hand. You fight back. I'm going to keep what I got. I ain't going to let life take it from me. Raise your hand high. Let me see. Okay, how many of you respond like I do? Life gets tough and I go find a rock. <laughs> go hide under the rock and get away from it. Raise your hand. Okay, now some of y'all didn't raise your hands. So y'all, y'all playing, y'all playing me. I'm up here. I'm going to ask you again. How many of you ask it this way? How many, you know that term? I learned this term in South Dakota. I never heard this term before. Buck up. That's got to be a frontier term. Okay. How many of you, when life gets tough, you buck up and you say, you're trying to, my expectation, I'm going to keep my expectation. It should be this way and I'm going to fight about it. How many of you like that? Fight with people, fight with circumstances. And how many of you like me, life gets tough and I'm looking for the nearest exit. I'm getting out. I'm out of here. I'm escaping. Okay. All right. So that's typically our response. From a counseling perspective, we would call that a fight. Or a flight response, right? Some of us fight for life and for our expectations to keep them. And some of us fly. We run away. Okay? Um, But that's what happens with believers, too. Is that when life throws us a curve, I either fight for it to keep it. Or I run. Uh, James says this. James 4. Write that down because I didn't put it in 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 the thing. James 4. Verse 1, verses 1 through 3 or 1 through 4 says this, and this is the New International, our new living. What causes the quarrels and fights among you? Isn't it that whole army of evil desires that war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have. You can't possess it, so you fight and quarrel to take them away. And so the scriptures even know, the scriptures even know that life presses me and throws me a curve. Now, even though that says fight and quarrel, how many of you know that if I go in under a rock, I'm still fighting? I'm still insisting on something. It may look like I ran away, but I'm running away because I'm insisting on something. If I fight, I'm insisting on something. And, and James nails that. There's three types of presses. So I'm going to share with you what scriptures, what the Psalms has shown me. There seems to be three ways we get pressed. Three ways, three kinds of curves. The first curve is a challenge. Now let me define challenge for you. Challenges are those things that we view as attacks. Challenges are those things that we view as that which goes against my expectations, my wants, and my desires. Okay? 
challenges. I want a nice car. I go to the dealership and he's trying to mess with me. And I amp it up because I want. I see his, his business plan to say, well, you know, we can't give it to you for that. What? You know, and I amp up. Now, there are certain things. If I'm on the basketball court, that dude that hides under a rock, I don't hide under a rock on the basketball court. I go to the challenges. Now I'm 47. I can't go to the challenges like I used to anymore, right? I go to the challenges. But the challenges are those things that we feel are against our expectations. Now, here's what's interesting. If you are a fight for your life, if you raised your hand and said, when a challenge comes or when something comes against me, I fight back, then you need anger. Anger is that which propels us, prepares us, gets us ready to fight. Gets us ready to fight. Gets us ready to keep what we have. Okay? But if you're a person who gets out, who avoids, who runs away, then fear is the response. And fear is the emotion that gets us ready for that, gets us ready and gets us prepared to move away, right? But interesting enough, now write this down because I didn't put it there because I want you to get this. There are two questions. So somebody angers me or a situation angers me and I think it's about that. And I think it's about that person. I think it's about my mom. My mom made me mad yesterday. So I'm this young 16-year-old who's mad at their parents. And I'm fighting with them about it. Okay? Or I'm somebody's wife who says, you know what? I kill my husband. But only she moves away. Okay? So anger and fear, you think that's about the person. Right? But did you know that your struggle was also with God? Here's the question you're asking God. If I'm angry... I'm asking God this question. God, are you really just? Is, is life fair for real? Are you going to let them take this from me? How come I can't keep life the way I expect it to be? So anger, if you get deep to it, tells you that you have a question. And the question is about God's justice. Fear. Interesting. Here's the question. If I move away in fear and I'm thinking I'm afraid of that person, I don't want to fight, I don't like confrontation, why should I have to stand up for my rights or why won't they just understand? Interesting. Fear begs the question of God. Do you really intend to protect me? Are you going to take care of me? Are you going to protect me like you said? I don't feel protected. Now, what happens is... If I satisfy what anger asks, I take matters into my own hand. And I say, God, you aren't just. I got to make it just. If I, satisfy, if I satisfy my fear, then I say to God, I guess you're not going to protect me. I'm going to find this shell and hide in it until it's safe to come out because you ain't going to take care of me. You see? So your emotional reactions have a deep connection to your questions about God. Second curve, second way in which life presses us, challenges our frame, is when we feel abandoned, alone. How many of you don't mind being alone? Raise your hand. Come on now. I can see. I got new glasses on. I can see you if you're trying to hide from me. How many of you can't stand being alone. Can't just can't absolutely stand it. Okay? Some of you don't mind being alone. Some of you can't stand it. But here's the deal. If I choose to be alone, that's different than being alone. My image for alone that's painful is to have what I want in my life and watch it float away from me. To be 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 on a be on a little canoe and I'm trying to get to the island and the current's taking me farther away. Okay? Now, if you're a fighter, you're going to say, I ain't having this aloneness. I'm fighting for my life. And the emotion that drives that is jealousy or envy. Jealousy is, I'm going to keep what I have and build a fence around it. And life, you can't take it from me. 
Envy is, I see what you have and I want it and I'm going to go get it. And James says, we are murderous about that. Jealousy is keeping what I have and having the arrogance to say, you can't have it and you can't challenge it. Don't leave me. Envy is saying, I see back there the guy in the green and his wife, they got something I want. And I'm going to figure out how to get it. Envy is that. That's, and, and jealousy is that emotion that generates us to fight against loneliness. Okay, despair, despair is a different response. Despair is that emotion that says, I guess not. I guess I'm alone. I guess I got to figure out how to live like this. Okay. And so, you have that abandonment, that thing that happens. Either the person in your life that you counted on wasn't there, or the circumstances changed and you found out you were alone. I was working once in a, a treatment unit here in town, and we had made a decision to challenge somebody. And I went away on vacation and came back, and we was at this meeting. And the person that we were going to challenge was there. Unbeknownst to me, though, I didn't know that they had changed their mind about the confrontation. So the person who was there we was going to challenge said, anybody have anything to say? And I, I perceived the silence as, well, people were scared to talk. So I stepped up. I said, well, you know, I'm just back here in school, back here at, the, at work, and I noticed this, this, and this. And I know that other people feel the same way, right? And they looked at me like y'all looking at me. I said, right? And, and people started doing this. I went, oh, no, because this situation, this lady we were confronting had authority. Now I just put my neck on the line, right? And nobody's got my back. Okay, now I'm a fleer, right? So I didn't go to jealousy or envy. I went to despair, like, oh, no, man, I guess I better pack up my stuff and get out of here, man, because she's finna fire me. And all y'all suckers, man. All y'all suckers. Y'all punks, man. I found out later. A couple guys came up to apologize to me, and they said, hey, dude, when, when you were gone, we decided we probably wouldn't confront her. I said, thanks for telling me. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. I'm like, and at that time, I wasn't trying to hear I'm sorry, because I was in despair. I had decided to take matters into my own hands. And, and when people enter into that with love and care, you reject it. That's what the scripture says. God brings his kindness to you in your pain. And sometimes when I'm swallowed up by my pain, I reject his kindness. I reject his understanding. And I looked at my friend and said, man, you're a punk, man. Don't even talk to me. He said, Jay, man, I'm, I said, man, I don't even want to hear from you. And it took me a while to start to think about the bigger perspective, right? So those are the emotions. You want to know the questions? How many want to know the questions? Deep questions about God. How many want to know? I'll leave, man, if y'all ain't going to talk to me. <laughs> All right, quickly. The question's about abandonment. If I experience jealousy, my question is, God, are you really good? And good is defined by me. God, is, is God going to be, is God going to be the guy who gives me the cookie? Is he going to give me life the way I defined it? God, are you really good? Because if you were good, you would give me a Mercedes Benz, the house out there with five acres. What's up with that? I want that. Okay? So deep question. If I experience despair, I'm asking this question of God. God, will you be present for me? Or will you withdraw your presence? Have you withdrawn your presence, God? And despair would say, yep. And so then the spirit says, but you better take care of yourself then. But the deep question I'm asking of God is, have you withdrawn your presence? There's one last one. One last curve. Life throws us intrusions. Now, interesting enough, intrusions are, if challenges are against and abandonment is moving away, Intrusions are moving towards us.
but often in a way that's unfamiliar or we perceive as a threat. So when people intrude, sometimes they intrude in a loving way. I'm looking at this couple right here. I'm intruding on their space. They were sitting all comfortable until I looked at them. And then he started smiling. She turned red, right? I'm looking at them. I'm intruding, okay? Now, it depends on if you know me or not. But if you don't know me, that intrusion, even though it's kind and caring, could be an intrusion that I perceive to be unfamiliar. You're coming at me, and no preacher's ever talked to me from the stage. Don't talk to me. Don't talk to me. I'm here to be talked to. Okay? It's unfamiliar. Or it's even dangerous. You put me on the spot. Okay? So when we have intrusions, we end up experiencing contempt. Either contempt for ourselves or contempt for you. Or shame. I say I'm ugly. Don't look at me. I move away. I drop my shoulders. I hide my face. Okay? So when love comes, I say I'm not lovable. Shame says you're not lovable. Love standing right there. You better turn your back, hide your face, because if love sees you, it's running. But love's standing there. If love was going to run, it would run. It's standing there. So shame says, turn away and hide your face. Contempt says to love, hit him in the mouth. You came at me in a way that was unfamiliar. Since I didn't understand how you was coming, I'm going to bust you. Okay? But the deep questions. Here are two deep questions. Contempt says... Does God love me? Contempt says, when people are true, do you love me? Now, here's the interesting thing. Do you love me the way I need to be loved? You know? I have a daughter, my middle daughter, who likes to get back rubs. You know? You know my wife likes service. She likes us to do things. You know, and I can say, well, I love her the way I, I need to be loved. But that's not it. I need to love the people in my life the way they need to be loved. And when I love them the way I need to be loved, you're going to get contempt back because it doesn't meet their needs. It doesn't come at them the right way. So, but the deeper question, when circumstances and people lead us to contempt, I want you to ask this question. I, I'm feeling contempt. Huh. So, I want, I, maybe, maybe I really think God doesn't love me because... Maybe what I've defined as good, I ain't getting it. And I'm, I've decided that since I don't have it, God must not love me. I'm pissed about that. The second question is, love intrudes and I turn away in shame. And that question is this. Will God, will you love me in the dark? When I'm doing dirt, do you love me? When I sinned, do you love me? When I had that rage response and I screamed at my daughter, do you love me? When I slammed the door and said, Mom, get out of my life, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me when I'm ugly? See, shame's answer is no. God's answer is yes. yes. Okay. We well, get ready. So those are... The emotions that I want to cover. Now, I'm, I'm not framing these emotions as bad or good, but I am wanting you to tip you off to the idea that this, that our strong emotional reactions not are, not, are not only tied to the people and circumstances in our life, but they're tied to our evaluation of God's involvement in our life. And the questions we ask, is God just? Will he protect me? Is God good? Is he present? Does he love me? Will he love me if I'm ugly? Those are critical questions I want you to think about. As we get ready for communion, I just want to read you a verse out of Matthew. Matthew says something really cool in this, in this verse. 29 to 30. Then Jesus said, and he's talking to the disciples, Come to me, all who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke fits perfectly, and my burden I give you is light. 
Jesus says, come, as we think about communion, and as I think about how do we apply this, you should think about this. When you have strong emotional responses, when you experience jealousy, envy, rage, when you experience contempt or despair, when you experience those, God said, bring them to me. Come to me. Now, the committee in my head will say, forget God, because if I'm having this experience, obviously he's not there. That's not true. The scripture says, come to me. With what? He says, bring your weariness and your bur- burdens. Now, the image of weary, the image of weary is to have baggage and pain that never stops wearing you down, having turmoil and chaos going. And what he says, the language there is it's continuous. Some of you say, you know, I've been a Christian for a while. I mean, life ain't got a whole lot better, Jay. You know, I got some good news for you and some bad news. You're right. That's the bad news. The good news is, even if it's still ugly, God's with you. Just like that lady yesterday, her baby started crying. She didn't put the baby down. The baby, she couldn't figure out what was wrong, but she didn't let the baby go. She actually brought the baby closer. She didn't put the baby down. She brought the baby closer. That's what God says he'll do. And burdens are the beyond the load. All of you have to carry a load. We all are responsible for our stuff. But a burden is beyond carryable. Now, how many of you guys are tough, tough men and women out there? I got it. I carry mine. I don't need no help. No, nah, man. I don't need no help. You look bad, Jay. No, nah, I'm fine, dude. How many of you like that? God says, let me help you carry the load, the burden. Burdens are uncarryable by yourself. So he wants you to bring your weariness and your burdens. And he makes a promise. He says, I'll give you rest. Now, rest doesn't mean that the whole burden goes away or that all of a sudden, bam, you know what? I'm worry free. I never, I'm worry, what's wrong with you? Your faith must be messed up. It isn't that. He gives you a place to rest. And he gives you peace. The, the image for peace is this. That before Christ, there was hostility between he and us. That wasn't peace. But now, because of Christ, we have the peace of Christ that goes with us. Meaning we can come to God no matter how we are. We can enter his throne. And God won't bring beef. He won't have heat. He won't be angry. He'll welcome us. Even when we come. Even when we come swinging our fists and frowning our face and ugly. God would rather have you hot or cold. Than lukewarm. He would rather have you mad or crazy passionate than in the middle. Come, bring it to him. And you'll find peace and rest. And then 2 Corinthians 1 verses 3 through 5 says, The God of all compassion who's given you compassion, he gave you compassion for what? He gave you compassion so that you could give the compassion away. He gave it to you so you can give it away. So here's the question. We're having communion today. There's going to be some songs that get played. Here's what I want you to think about. Don't put your emotions away. Don't put your weariness away. Don't put your burden away. The table represents the king. And he says, come. So I want you to bring your weight. Bring your trouble. Bring your worry. Bring your jealousy. Bring your envy to the table. God says, come to me, and I will give you rest, and I will give you peace. As they play songs, come and partake of the blood, of the wine, of the juice and the bread that represent God's body and his blood. And as we get done, then the worship scene will come up, and we'll do another song, and I'll pray for you. <coughs> All right, let me pray. Dear Father, we thank you. We thank you for your son. We thank you for the service. But most of all, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We ask that you help us to begin to understand how we're wired. And know that the way we're wired and how we feel is a direct reflection of your character. 
so we don't have to be ashamed or run away from it. Help us ask the deep questions, the questions that are connected to you as we experience ourselves in relationships and in circumstances. I pray for the folks that are here who are seeking, Lord. Help them to continue to come to get their questions answered. And I want to encourage those folks who already know you and who are believers. Help them to know that life here on this planet is weary and full of burdens. But you say, come and find rest and peace. In Jesus' name we pray.